Welcome to today's webinar. My name is Jose Francisco, Project Manager at the IAS USA. Today's webinar will be going over optimization of antiretroviral therapy. I'd like to welcome today's speaker, Dr. Roger Bedima. Welcome, Dr. Bedima. Thank you, Jose, and welcome to all for attending this virtual session, uh, which is after your virtual lunch, I hope. Uh, the session is titled Optimization of Antiretroviral Therapy. And let's go over the CME information. As you can see on this slide, the activity is uh, <clears throat> created for 1.25 AME PRA category one credits. And these are the different credits this uh, activity is approved for, the CME uh, mock points, ABI mock points, nursing credit hours, pharmacotherapy credit, and pharmacy contact hours. And instructions for claiming credit will be emailed to you. And this is acknowledging grant support for this webinar. And navigating the webinar, uh, poll questions. Uh, you see here a separate window that will show the poll questions and choose your response from the poll. And the responses will be displayed after the poll closes. And uh, we will be asking the pre-test questions and post-test questions as well. So asking the presenter questions, this is the process for doing so. <clears throat> you see here, submit your questions using the Q&A button. Uh, your first and last name must be indicated in order to, to have your questions addressed. And generally most questions will be answered at the end of the webinar. And we apologize if we are not able to address all questions. And this is the uh, first poll, just to have an idea. What proportion of your patients would you uh, would who would be eligible? Uh, do you expect will be interested in starting or changing a regimen that includes an injectable drug? One is none. Two is about five percent. Three about ten percent. Four about twenty five percent. Five about fifty percent. And C more than fifty percent. Please vote. Now let's go ahead and see the results. So uh, this probably the majority probably reflect my impression of my patient population. That is that about 45% will probably eat up to either initiate or switch to an injectable drug. Now let's move on to the first, oh, sorry, the, so this is then uh, again, the title of the activity. And we will see next the learning objectives. What we would like to accomplish today upon completion of this activity is for the learner to be able to identify general principles that we use in optimizing antiretroviral therapy in the setting of virologic suppression and least indications for antiretroviral modification in the setting of virologic suppression and describe evidence-based strategies for antiretroviral optimization in the setting uh, of virologic suppression. You can see that I repeated every time in the same of virologic suppression because managing virologic failure is not the objective of this uh, lecture, but we'll be able to answer questions in that regard. Pretest case number one. This is a 54 year old man who's virologically suppressed on this regimen of return, uh, repivirin, uh, repivirin FTC TDF. And this patient is a 54-year-old man diagnosed with HIV 10 years ago. Baseline laboratory values are as follows, CD4 count 120, HIV RNA 85,000, genotype wild type, HLABC 71 negative, meaning that should you choose to do so, you could safely prescribe a Bacavir to this patient. Uh, HSV, HBS so this antibody is uh, positive, uh, so hepatitis B immune, hepatitis B antibody positive, hepatitis C RNA negative, has received repivirin FTC TDFC diagnosis. Current laboratory values are as follows HIV RNA uh, levels fewer than 50 copies with rare blips. CD4 cell count is 650. Creatinine clearance is 80. Comorbidities include hypertension, coronary disease, the status post myocardial infarction, asthma, GERD, multiple new health problems since uh, uh, the past few months to sustain the risk fracture. Undergo dexascan showing osteoporosis, prescribed calcium, vitamin D, and alendronate, uh, worsening asthma, 
uh, attacks and heartburn. Uh, he specifically prescribed uh, omeprazole and inhaled fruticason for these two problems. So this is the typical aging person uh, with antiretroviral therapy that you will have in your practice. The patient is generally satisfied with natural regimen, but does not always like the fact that must take it with meals. What changes would you <clears throat> recommend to this patient's antiretroviral regimen? A, one is to continue the current regimen of rifivirin FTC-TDF. Two, switch to bictagravir FTC-TAF. Three, switch to bictagravir uh, <clears throat> Sorry, this is uh, redundant. Um, uh, uh, four, switch to uh, dolitegravir repivirin, and five, switch to evategravir covid that FTC TAF. So please uh, vote the best uh, answer to uh, this question. I apologize for the redundance of uh, two and three. That was a mistake. But please go ahead and vote. All right, so the majority of participants will switch to Bictagravir FTC TAF, and we'll go through the other uh, possible answers uh, at the end of the <clears throat> presentation when we cover the relevant material. And this is the pretest question number two. Uh, a 35 year old white man with on Favrens FTC TDA for the past 10 years has been very reluctant to change a regimen that quote unquote saved his life. However, due to persistent insomnia and depressive disorder, um, is forced to do so. CD4 card is 700, uh, viral load is fewer than 20 copies. A switch to Bictagravir FTC TAF will result in which of the following? One, no change in weight as the patient was already virologically suppressed on the regimen that he's on currently. Two, weight loss given that TAF is associated with fewer metabolic complications. So switching to a TAF continuing regimen will result in some weight loss. Three, weight gain because of switch from TDF to TAF. And four, weight gain because of switch from a five race to Bictagravir. And five, both answers three and four are correct. Please go ahead and vote. All right, so 64% of the respondent answered both three and four. And we will, uh, with the next, the runner up being uh, weight gain because of switch from a five uh, to big tegra view. So let's uh, look at the relevant material and we come back to these questions in the post test assessment. The first portion of this uh, presentation. Uh, is reviewing the general principles for antiretroviral optimization. So why modify antiretroviral therapy in a person who's already virologically suppressed and doing well on that? And the second question is what are the principles and what pitfalls, pitfalls you have to watch out for in antiretroviral therapy modification? And this is the framework I like to follow to uh, address this. <clears throat> what are the reasons for regimen optimization during virologic suppression? I did a little mnemonic I put to myself to uh, look, go through that. One is simplification. We might want to simplify a regimen because even as the patient was biologically suppressed, he, achieved, he or she achieved that at the cost of a large pill burden and high frequency of dosing twice a day or more frequently. <clears throat> so this might be one great reason for considering simplification. Another one that came in just uh, became relevant just a few days ago because of <clears throat> the approval uh, of long acting injectable antiretroviral therapy in the US is a simplification to switch from oral to long acting injectables. And we will uh, visit that later. The second big reason is tolerability. We may want to enhance tolerability even as the patient is virologically suppressed uh, on the regimen they're taking interactions, we may want to prevent or mitigate drug-drug interactions when we <clears throat> uh, uh, switch a person away from a regimen that even if it was working, 
uh, was uh, resulting in a certain number of uh, drug-drug interactions. Same thing with food and fluids. We visit that patient earlier on who was happy with their regimen, but did not like the fact that they had to take it with food. So we may want to switch in order to eliminate food or fluid requirements with antiretroviral therapy. And the second F is uh, fertility or pregnancy. We may want to consider optimization of antiretroviral therapy during uh, pregnancy. And we will just visit that uh, with uh, one pros and cons of uh, newer regimens, especially containing integrase inhibitors in the case of pregnancy. And finally, we may want to consider to switch to reduce cost. So here again is a little more detail, these uh, principles. Uh, we have to remember that first do no harm. The main issue is still to maintain virologic suppression. It's not wise to switch someone from a regimen uh, that led to virologic suppression to another one that is less likely to do so. And this is, we will visit the cautionary tale in such a switch. Uh, namely switching from a regimen that had a so-called high genetic barrier in which people are less likely to develop uh, uh, failures or resistance to one that was less intense and had led to failures. <clears throat> so we have to assess prior resistance before switch because once selected, resistance mutations are usually quote unquote archived. So a person who has failed a certain regimen might have developed mutations that even if he or she was resuppressed on another uh, uh, regimen, those mutations may be quote unquote archived and awaiting uh, the patient to be switched to a regimen that doesn't fully suppress them for these mutations to become apparent. So with history of multiple failure or prior regimens, pro-viral DNA genotypic testing may be useful. This is a testing that can be done in a person who is virologically suppressed, so there's no RNA to test, so they can test the proviral DNA. While this is a potentially helpful uh, intervention, it's important to state at the outset that the concordance of this proviral DNA with uh, <clears throat> RNA genotyping is not very good. So proviral DNA might fail to identify some or all of the existing uh, mutations. So use it with caution. Consider hepatitis B uh, co-infection or other comorbidities before the switch. Maintain at least two HBV active drugs in the new regimen. So 3TC or FTC as sole HBV active drugs, not recommended. So if you're switching somebody from a regimen that contain two active hepatitis B uh, drugs like TDF and FTC, don't switch to something that contain only FTC or TTC as APT active drugs. Consider drug drug interactions and the potential for pregnancy when you do switch. So, review of antiretroviral history is paramount. There are some drugs that are considered to have a low genetic barrier to resistance. Those include a 5 rns 3 tc FTC, a first generation. Uh, integrating inhibitors like retegravir and ivategravir. So if somebody was on those drugs and they have a history of failure on them, you have to assume they have developed resistance to them even if you don't know, have documentation of such, which is very important. So within class switches, I usually, usually do maintain virology suppression if no resistance to the drugs in that class were present. And so this within class switches for one high resistant barrier to another high resistance bar uh, barrier drug are reasonable, like switching from Bictegravir to Dolutegravir or vice versa. If you switch in between classes, between class switching from one high resistant barrier drug to another, like boosted protease inhibitor to newer integrase inhibitors like Bictegravir or Dolutegravir, and at least one fully active NRTI are uh, okay. And let's say a person has at least one fully active NRTI in the core regimen in conjunction with boosted protease inhibitor, it would be okay to switch them to uh, uh, <clears throat> NRTI uh, uh, combo that they were on uh, with Bictegravir or Dolitegravir. So it's important to assess prior resistance before switching. Again, we said that it's caution uh, must be exercised when switching from a boosted PI to another class uh, if full treatment resistance is not known. 
people might uh, fail a boosted protease inhibitor based regimen without having recent associated mutation uh, to uh, uh, boosted PR. So it's very important to be cautious with that. So once selected again, we talked about the uh, uh, mutations being archived. So issue of uh, uh, full uh, multiple failures have to be a cautionary tale with switch. So we talked about considering hepatitis B, we, we talked about uh, comorbidities and the ones that you should be looking forward to addressing uh, cardiovascular disease because drugs uh, may increase the risk, at least in observational studies. Uh, this uh, includes abacavir and booster protein inhibitors like uh, darunavir. Renal function, of course, important when uh, as uh, if you want to switch to a regimen in which either uh, uh, dosing uh, may be re reduced in in, in renal uh, uh, dysfunction like uh, TCCFTC or uh, contraindicated with low renal function like TDF. Bone mineral density especially important uh, uh, with TDF. Uh, other co-infections, so we talk about considered drug interactions. Uh, it's important to know that in the setting of pregnancy, prevention of mother to child transmission is another goal rather uh, in addition to biologic suppression. And there has been some concerns uh, with the retrograde neurotube defect. I will give you some updates uh, to that particular uh, story. So evidence-based antiretroviral optimization in biologically suppressed patients. Number one, we talked about within class switches. We look at some examples of that. And then uh, between class switches, again, an example or two. Uh, for all these uh, uh, strategies, I will just offer an example and we'll be happy to answer additional questions later. It's uh, simplification also has begun to mean fewer drugs. Switch to two drug regimens will be discussed as well as heart of the press switch to long acting injectables. And here are strategies that have been shown uh, to be effective in, uh, in trials. Not all these are current and, and not all these are used in most patients today, but it's important to know that there have been within class switches that have been shown in, uh, in, in trials from TDA for back away to TAF, from pratagravir or vatagravir or first line integrase inhibitors to dolutegravir from dolutegravir uh, to or atelvagravir to bictegravir from efavirenz to uh, uh, repilvirin, from uh, boosted PIA with ritonavir to boosted PIA with cobicistat, uh, from uh, boosted uh, adesanavir uh, with uh, cobicistat or ritonavir to all boosted adesanavir when used in conjunction with vacavir 3 cc And the big uh, between class switches that we've seen in trials uh, have included boosted PIAs to integrase inhibitors or to repivirin, um, switching from NNRTR-based regimen to INSTI-based regimens. And less of uh, 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 interest, especially in, in the setting of uh, availability of uh, integrase inhibitors is boosted PS to maraviroc in people with CCR5, the CCR5 virus. And again, here are examples. I picked this for a reason. There are many studies, we're not gonna go through them, this one is important because people with documented or suspected resistance to NRTIs, NNRTI were permitted to enter the study. There are few studies that have evidence-based uh, uh, <clears throat> uh, that showed efficacy of switching uh, in people with documented failure. And I'll show you a table later on to address this, but this is important to address because uh, patients who had documented failure were enrolled in this study, <clears throat> uh, switching uh, from stable triple adultography based antiretroviral therapy to bictegravir FTC TAF, and the switch being non inferior to continuing a dolutegravir based therapy. Importantly, looking at people who had. Uh, uh, <clears throat> either the overall population or people who had the following resistance, uh, uh, K65R or three or more times, other NRTR resistance, no NRTR resistance, uh, whether or with or without M184V, there was no difference in virologic outcome. And 
the summary is in the box. Data suggests that switching one high-resistant barrier drug for another may be effective in patients with viral suppression, even in the setting of underlying resistance. This is what study 38430 can show us. And here's the cautionary tale for between class switches. Now, I told you earlier that if you had a patient who was on a favorance TDA, uh, uh, um, FTC or 3TC or ratagravir and fail those uh, regimens on this, you have to assume that they may have developed resistance to those drugs because they're so-called low genetic barrier. And this study gives another perspective to low resistance barrier uh, regimens. Um, it's a random multiple blood trial in which virologically suppressed patients were continued on lopinavir, ritonavir based uh, regimen or switched to a ratagravir based regimen. And those who had previous uh, resistance associated uh, mutations uh, to NRTIs did fail more when they switched to a <coughs> ratagravir based regimen. So this has been a cautionary tale uh, in that underlying resistance does matter, especially if you switch into a regimen containing a drug with low resistance barrier like uh, Rategravi. So simplification may also mean moving to fewer drugs. Uh, so less is more. And this is uh, an animation <coughs> from way in the past when regimens contain many pills to starting in 2006 with single tablet regimen uh, up to now when we do now have quite a number of uh, single tablet regimens to choose from. And, and so we are in a situation now where we really do have several options, including NNRTIs, integrase inhibitor, and PI-based regimens that are, in, uh, are, are, are included in single tablet regimens. So, I will get back to this when switching from a suppressant antiretroviral therapy to a single tablet regimen uh, to reiterate the fact that several have been studied in the past several years and all show non inferiority uh, to other multi pill or multi drug uh, regimens that people will switch from. And uh, again, highlighted here is the study I presented to you earlier, switching to uh, the study 38430 because. Uh, patients with resistance were permitted. So, and you're also going to see in at the bottom two rows, switching to two drug regimens. Again, uh, less is more being able to do with fewer uh, drugs. And I will uh, uh, come back to switching to dual regimens later. And we mentioned study 380 as a, an example of being able to switch to a single tablet regimen in people who had been virologically suppressed but with history of failures. This is another one where you <clears throat> are switching uh, to Elvatagravir, Cobicistat, FTC, TAF, plus Darunavir, and people with multiple treatment experience and history of failure was found to be uh, uh, efficacious. So this is Monster Center Open Level Randomized Phase three Study. Uh, treatment experienced patients who are now suppressed for over four months, but with history of more than two antiretroviral classes, including uh, three or fewer TMD mutations uh, and or cases, from, uh, but no INST or Darunavir resistance, uh, uh, did extremely well with switching to this regimen. And again, moving on to what is a paradigm shift in antiretroviral therapy for the past couple of years, which is a dual regimen. Now, I'm not discussing dual regimens in initial therapy, since this is an optimization lecture. I'm looking at dual regimens in the context of uh, biologic suppression and switching to patient with biologic suppression. And we see here that there was a non-inferiority uh, uh, either immediate or delayed switch to uh, dolitography or plus repivirine uh, versus continuing a baseline antiretroviral therapy. And so this is not the only one. There have been several options of maintenance therapy with uh, two drug antiretroviral therapy. And I will not go through all the studies, but you can see that those uh, 
uh, regimens include uh, boosted PS plus 3TC, the OLE, the Atlas, the Salt, and Duo, uh, Dolutegravir plus 3TC, um, <clears throat> and Aspire, Lamido, uh, and Tango, which was uh, fully powered uh, uh, phase three study. So from which we can uh, attest that this strategy is efficacious. And, <clears throat> and here it is uh, switching to Dolutegravir 3TC, versus continuing tap based antiviral therapy in virologically suppressed adult. This is an international randomized open label phase three study in patients with no uh, prior <coughs> uh, virologic failure, uh, NRTR or inst resistance. So, and they were switched to Dolutegravir 3 tc and that switch was non-inferior to continuing tap based antiretroviral regimen. Now, other examples of uh, maintenance with uh, two uh, drug antiretroviral uh, regimens do exist, and including integrase inhibitor plus uh, NRTI, which is the SORT 1 and 2 uh, uh, studies, the <clears throat> uh, uh, leading to FDA approval uh, of that uh, uh, regimen in 2017, and the brave new world of uh, injectable uh, dual antiretroviral regimens with carbotegravir and rilipivirine. And here are the studies uh, uh, germane to our presentation here. We will uh, uh, discuss the ATLAS study, but this, uh, 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 which led to the approval of uh, this combination just last week. Darunavir, Ritonavir plus Dolutegravir, another strategy that we looked at in uh, several studies, uh, plus Dolutegravir, sorry, that we looked at in several studies. And we'll focus on what is probably uh, going to be a bigger paradigm shift in antiretroviral therapy than any that we've seen in the past several, in the past couple of decades of use of triple therapy, which is long acting injectables with uh, two drugs, Carbotegravir and Pivrin. And we jump uh, into the simplification or optimization is the ATLAS study uh, where we had patients who had PR, NNRTR, or INSTI-based ant uh, antiretroviral uh, therapy with a two NRTR backbone were randomized to either continue what they had or after a four uh, <clears throat> a week uh, uh, leading of oral carbotegravir repivirin uh, switch to a long-acting carbotegravir um, um, uh, <clears throat> and long-acting repivirin monthly uh, injections. And the extension phase of uh, ATLAS 2M we will discuss uh, 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 later. And these were 616 patients where uh, and, and the carbotegravir and repivirin were used at uh, 400 and 600 milligrams every four weeks respectively. And here's the uh, uh, the data, um, uh, carbotegravir repivirin uh, long-acting was non-inferior to continue baseline antiretroviral therapy. Biologic failure was confirmed in three participants who received the long-acting treatment and four participants who received oral therapy. Adverse events were more common in the long-acting therapy group, uh, mostly injection site uh, reaction pain. Um, um, the overwhelming majority were mild and the large majority of participants did prefer the injectables to the oral. Now, this is uh, probably mad made you think that, well, these people uh, signed up for a study where they were likely to receive an injectable drug. So, uh, of course, they were okay with injectables. But I will let us show you a survey that suggests that it's not just the people who were randomized uh, who signed up for this study, but it was all comers were, who tended to prefer injectables. So, remember, answers to your questions in the past, we suggested the majority of you at least that 25% of uh, participants in your clinics will go for this uh, strategy. I will show you how that compared to a survey that was conducted. But even less is even more be, uh, from ATLAS, which is monthly injection to ATLAS 2M, uh, every two month injections, these are two populations, adult uh, from the ATLAS that we just presented, uh, receiving tabotography, long acting, repeatedly long acting every four weeks, or standard of care antiretroviral therapy, and patients are receiving the standard of care uh, antiretroviral therapy outside of ATLAS. All of them were again randomized after an oral leading 
to receive cathode photography every pivot every eight weeks or every four weeks. And the primary endpoint being HIV RNA, more than 50 copies by uh, FDA at week 48, by FDA snapshot analysis. And here you see that there was non-inferiority of the every eight weeks compared to every four week uh, uh, <clears throat> strategy. And tabotegravir and recovery long acting were well tolerated with 98% uh, of injection site reaction being on the mild range, grade one or two. And patients did prefer uh, capture uh, over oral therapy. And those who received every eight weeks did prefer that to every four week dosing. And that one probably you would say goes without saying. And this is the survey I did promise to show you of patients with HIV in North and South Carolina, <clears throat> a mean age of 47, 81% uh, uh, of uh, racial ethnic minority, 95% of whom were African-American. Greater interest in injection were those with higher education at younger age. But you can see here the preferences of this uh, participant to this survey, either uh, one pill once a week, two shots every other month, uh, or uh, uh, which is uh, uh, ATLAS, or two shots, uh, 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 two implants every six months. You see that a majority would prefer, uh, are interested in switching to every other month or ATLAS 2M regimen. Uh, and even greater majority appears to if and when that becomes available in implants. So patients, by and large, seem to prefer injectables, and this would be a big paradigm shift. And uh, this is uh, at last 2M, again, Q4 versus Q8 weeks, a phase three uh, open label non-inferiority study, and the patient population uh, were on standard of care <coughs> uh, 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 at or the previous ATLAS patients, and I'll just uh, show you the non-inferiority that Q8 week is as, uh, was non-inferior to every four weeks. Now, this is a paradigm shift. We presented one paradigm shift, which is moving from two drugs, uh, from three drug therapy to two drug therapy. Second paradigm shift here, even greater, uh, moving from oral daily therapy to week, uh, monthly, or maybe soon, every two month injectables. So <clears throat> other potential benefit of this uh, include uh, relief pill fatigue and decreased potential stigma that's associated with taking pills every day and ease of documenting adherence. Of course, if you can document that somebody received the shot, that is a lot better than uh, if they, <clears throat> uh, they have to rely on self-recall. Now, carbotegravir pivrin, uh, however, has challenges because this is administered in healthcare settings and there's also a neural leading. So this, uh, 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 we may call for a, a, an organization that some uh, settings may not have. And there may be potential disruptions when people travel and uh, there's no prior um, um, uh, requires the Atlas and Atlas 2M require prior uh, 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 recent to ECI and NNITI uh, <clears throat> uh, to be absent, uh, except for uh, a K1 and 3 n mutation and no previous biologic failure. Maybe this will be studied uh, later on uh, in people who had previous failures. And also since, again, we do not have two HBV active drugs, so HBV co-infected participants, uh, patients will be excluded from this. So it might get even simpler again, because remember 58% of uh, respondents in this uh, North and South Carolina survey would have preferred an implantable. And one may just be around the corner. This is uh, a nucleus reverse transcriptase translocator inhibitor uh, called Islatravir, and <clears throat> which is an adenosine analog and active against uh, NITR resistant viruses and really long half-life leading itself to a uh, very frequent, a uh, very infrequent oral parenteral uh, formulation and even uh, an implantable formulation. So these are results from phase 2B study for is lateral view derived in uh, plus 3TC versus derived in TTC TDF <clears throat> in treatment uh, naive uh, uh, participant showing non-inferiority of, uh, of this strategy. So stay tuned 
it might get even simpler than uh, daily oral treatment, uh, a single tablet regimen. It might be even simpler than dual therapy oral daily. It might be even simpler than injection every month or every two months. So we might soon go to either implantable uh, 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 macro patch injections and other, uh, other nano formulations that are being looked at. Now let's move on to tolerability. Why would we switch a perfectly working uh, antiretroviral therapy? Uh, because we might improve tolerability and toxicities of, uh, 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 to the patients. Uh, and I will highlight a few. Low bone mineral density or history of fractures, uh, uh, <clears throat> cardiovascular disease risk or people with pre existing um, uh, uh, myocardial infections like the patients I presented earlier, uh, chronic kidney disease or proximal tuberculopathy, and the thing that has concerned us in the past couple of years, the emerging uh, uh, recognition of weight gain on antiretroviral therapy. So it's important to note that people on suppressive antiretroviral therapy have significant improvement in survival. However, the gap in survival uh, is still accounted for by non-AIDS complications, including cardiovascular, renal disease, osteoporosis, non-AIDS cancers. And those are the ones that we have to mitigate, at least not worsen uh, by our antiretroviral therapy. Why do I say that? The pathogenesis of these chronic complications include patient factors. Of course, people come into HIV disease with already having individual social factors that may have predisposed them for these long-term complications. In addition, the virus itself via its chronic inflammation and immune activation or co-infections such as hepatitis C, and I may, not, I may also mention CMV, might worsen uh, the risk of this uh, metabolic complication. However, our antiretroviral therapy might just compound uh, rather than ameliorate this. Now, data in some of these instances has been controversial, but we need to at least uh, uh, hit the fact that some antiretroviral therapy uh, uh, drugs may increase cardiovascular risk, uh, renal disease, osteoporosis, and we need to be mindful of the fact that even in the setting of allergy suppression and immunoconstitution, non ace malignancies drive a lot of the morbidity and mortality. So here's the bone. Patients living with, uh, people living with HIV have an increased risk of osteoporotic fracture. This has been abundantly shown. What I'm not going to show you, which started uh, being uh, shown in studies in Denmark, in that those who are actually co-infected with hepatitis C has an even greater risk of uh, fractures, uh, much greater than people who are only infected, uh, 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 only living with HIV. Now, we have seen many studies in uh, antiretroviral modification showing some hint of mitigation of these uh, uh, toxicities. I'm just gonna mention here, for example, that switching someone to emtricidabib plus stemonophobia lafenamide has been shown to improve uh, bone mineral density versus continuing on uh, emtricidabib from uh, plus stemonophobia uh, desopressive femoral. Uh, on the right, I want you to give an example that switching someone, and this is a need to two, I believe, uh, switching someone from a PI, uh, a boosted PI plus uh, two NRTI to dolutegravir leads to significant improvements in many of these lipid parameters. So those are potential benefits. And I put here additional consideration in either one, either the uh, TAF or integrase inhibitors with this potential benefit have come some consideration that we may also have a potential for weight gain. So antiretroviral therapy today is balancing what are the potential benefits and what are the uh, emerging uh, concerns in tolerability. So we also need to be sanguine in our assessment of fracture risk. We know that people in HIV have an increased risk of fracture. We also know that people living with HIV has a, have a decline in bone mineral density when you initiate antiretroviral therapy, which subsequently plateaus, as you see in the curve on the right. And we know that decreased bone mineral density is greater with regimens containing TDF, FTC. 
And I just showed you that if you switch these people to a regimen containing calf FTC, that bone marrow density increases. What we need to understand is that we're not certain that this is what explains the real increased fracture risk in people with HIV. This is a small uh, study we did looking at people who initiated a back of your versus CDF contained regimen. We see that there's definite difference in bone mineral density between the two, but there's no difference in this uh, marker called trabecular bone score, which assesses uh, bone macroarchitecture and is a better prediction of fracture risk. That leads to the question, do we know for sure that we can predict bone mineral density uh, uh, fracture risk by the decline in bone mineral density that we see with tdf -FTC? Or should we be uh, looking for a better measurement of fragility, of bone fragility in people living with HIV? I think the latter. Now comes the concern with weight gain with antiretroviral therapy. Uh, uh, a small study, uh, 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 a retrospective analysis we did uh, here in Dallas, uh, showing that weight gain uh, on antiretroviral therapy was greater in women and Blacks and Hispanics uh, than respectively in males and uh, in Blacks. And, and this was a retrospective analysis, but what really advanced the field significantly on understanding weight gain is the so-called advanced study in South Africa, the randomized naive participant to type FTC plus the retrograde to TDF FTC plus the retrograde to TDF FTC plus the fibrins, and showing that here in men, we have incrementally greater uh, weight gain for the TAF FTC to retrograde greater than TDF FTC to retrograde and much less weight gain with TDF FTC fibrins. And that magnitude was again much greater. Uh, 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 twice as big in women than in men. And unlike men here, in women, there was no hint of plateau even at two um, uh, years. So this is important and it's important to uh, consider and has been analyzed in another ret a large retrospective study of uh, um, uh, uh, Gilead uh, studies, showing again that uh, integrase inhibitors associated with greater weight gain um, and among integrated inhibitors appears that it was the newer ones, Victor Gravio and Dolitech Gravio, and among NRTI, it appears that TAF greater than Abaca greater than TDF. Now, you might look at this and say, well, that is probably, that probably is not, means that people who living with HIV, initiate antiretroviral therapy, are have inflammation decreases, they eat better and everything is fine, then they gain weight. And that may be the end of the story, but that is not so because even those who are already virologically suppressed on other antiretroviral regimens, when they switch to integrase-based regimens, they observe greater weight gain. And these are uh, <coughs> retrospective studies that have shown that there are numerous, and this is the newer one, which is the NA Accord weight gain with switch to integrase inhibitors. And those recurring themes here on the right, women, non-white, and older people with HIV with viral suppression had a greater annualized weight gain after switching from NNRTI to INSTI. A discordant note from the previous uh, studies was that those who switched from PI to easy, did not achieve greater weight gain. In fact, seem to have had some um, uh, uh, decrease in weight. Now, this has been discordant from uh, other findings where even people who switched from PI had increased weight on INSTI. So, bottom line, what is clear is that switching from an NNRTI to INSTI is associated with greater weight gain. So is switch from TDEF to TAF. This is explicit analysis in Germany uh, showing, I think that the graph is uh, uh, self-explanatory. If you stayed on TDEF, your weight was relatively stable. If you switch to TAF, you had a three uh, 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 point increase in uh, BMI, which is significant. And the same uh, sort of to some extent have been shown in this steel uh, study, which is switch from uh, 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 switch to a back of TTC versus TDF. And you remember the Paul Sachs analysis in CID last year showed that uh, <clears throat> among NRTI, it was tough, associated with greater weight gain, and then a back of and then TDF. 
So again, switched from TDF to TAF was actually weight gain in this opera study, regardless of the anchor drug in NNRTI or boosted TI. So what is the approach? Since we're talking about optimizing, now we have a problem. We have people who switch to uh, the antiretroviral regimens that are recommended for most to the insti base and gain weight. What do we do? First, I think we need to be candid and discuss that possibility upfront that before prescamatoral therapy, uh, especially that contain insti, plus or minus staff, that weight gain might occur, especially if you're a woman, especially if you're black or Hispanic. And if weight gain does occur, it's important to tell patients that there's no good data on reversibility. So switching them to another regimen, I would not probably will work, but we just don't have data to point to that. And these studies are ongoing. Now, there's a, a limited uh, also data on what is the metabolic impact, possible increase in insulin resistance. That's what's been shown the most. Uh, cardiovascular risk not clearly shown. And we have other studies like Tango, where people switch uh, to dolutegravir TTC versus continued uh, TAF-based uh, triophotron uh, therapy. There was no difference in weight gain after this, the, the switch to dolutegravir TTC. So it's a caution. But again, those who had been, <clears throat> uh, uh, there was a differential weight gain depending on how long you've been on TAF. But again, this is something that we have to tell patients that we don't, sh we don't show whether there is a, a um, uh, an impact of switching therapy. And we also have newer uh, uh, NNRTIs uh, that derive in uh, uh, switch to them from older ones in virtually suppressed patients. It resulted in a minimal weight gain. But again, this is not controlled, so we don't know what to make of it. All we can say is that those who switch to derive in TCC, TDF, had minimal weight gain at six and 12 months. So. Lower doses, less is even more. Um, uh, two studies that show that a lower dose of efavirenz or a lower dose of darunavir were associated with non-inferior to continuing the higher dose that uh, we, we have used for both drugs. So, so we may well be able to do with fewer uh, uh, drugs than we do now. So. Let's uh, uh, look at uh, tolerability to uh, recap. Special attention to older patients because of uh, polypharmacy in these patients, and I'll show you data on that. <clears throat> uh, low binomial density history of fragility fractures considered switch from TDF to TAF. Um, abacavir increases, uh, 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 TAF or abacavir, uh, TDF to TAF or TDF to abacavir will increase BMD. The significance clinically is unclear. That is something uh, I, I want to emphasize. High risk cardiovascular disease uh, switch from Abacavir to TAF or TDF. Um, and the cardiovascular risk associated with Abacavir has been uh, shown in retrospective uh, or cohort analysis. Um, same thing with return of your occupancy boosted PI. Uh, uh, so you with increased CVD and so switch to uh, uh, INST uh, can be considered. For chronic kidney disease, of course, switch for TDF to TAF or Abacavir, and from Adazanavir, Returnavir to either Dolutegravir, Tegravir, Rategravir, and Atia have all been used. Uh, for weight gain, we mentioned unclear benefit of switch. Now, interactions. Uh, we're getting uh, um, uh, to the <clears throat> uh, home stretch. Uh, interactions important in the aging HIV population because they are on a number of drugs and polypharmacy and inappropriate prescribing is very common in these uh, uh, patients. And uh, with a significant proportion of them uh, being on five or more medications, average number of medications being 12, uh, including non-HIV non medications, and these appropriate prescriptions by other criteria that have been approved has been demonstrated time and again. So drug drug interactions, very important. Please use a drug drug interaction uh, tools online like the Liverpool ones, because it's really difficult to keep track of all the non-HIV drugs people are on uh, and, or potential risk, they might 
opposed to the regimen you are switching them to. So um, it's very important. And I will just uh, highlight a few here. Uh, for polyvalent cation, they decrease uh, insta exposure. So it means on the space dosing. I will show you a little more in the next slide. A direct acting anticoagulant, they increase the vitrogravir uh, exposure. Uh, they just recommend caution. Anti-seizure medications like abamecin or uh, phenytoin, they decrease insta exposure, but can be used uh, with dolotegravir BID with capamazepine. Uh, metformin increase uh, big term dolotegravir exposure. So uh, a caution. Um, uh, with those who are being dosed twice with dolotegravir, rafamycin will decrease insta exposure. Uh, so you can use rafabutin with dolotegravir. Steroid exposure is increased with uh, avatogravir cobicista. It's important even with inhaled fluticasone. Uh, I can show you in the patient I presented earlier. So the, 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 the the patient, and again, this is a real story of a patient of mine, somebody with uh, uh, severe uh, COPD admitted several times uh, uh, with exacerbation. And what happens when the patient gets admitted, gets admitted with exacerbation, they get steroid uh, as well. So uh, for their HIV, they had been switched from uh, uh, TDF FTC effavorins to an Evatagravicopy sister containing regimen. And with Continued frequent expo admissions with COPD exacerbation and repeated uh, uh, steroid exposure, they be develop Cushing syndrome. So this is something you want to make sure that you you avoid in people who uh, uh, have comorbidities. And PPR decreases exposure to uh, adazanavir and ribavirin. Uh, HMG cause inhibited statin. Their metabolism can impair uh, can be impaired by PI leading to uh, increased serum toxicity. So. This is just to tell you again, because it's used a lot, uh, polyvalent uh, cardinal supplements, because this may not show up in the patient's drug list because they're over the counter. <clears throat> uh, that uh, uh, recommended uh, big tegravir and supplement containing can be taken uh, together with food. Uh, Dolitegravir and supplements containing calcium and iron can be taken together with food. Alternatively, uh, administer dolitegravir two hours before or more than six hours uh, after the supplements. And Evatagravir, Cobicista, and Rateravir give instance two hours before or more than six hours after supplements containing these polyvalent cations. So we finished, we talked about simplification, uh, uh, tolerability, <clears throat> interaction, and, and, and with a drug and with food. And now we talk about uh, very quickly uh, optimization in pregnancy. Uh, there was a big hoopla in 2018 about the SEPAMO study, which showed that uh, uh, increased risk of neurotrip defect with uh, dolitegravir exposure conception. And this, of course, caused uh, a, a significant consternation. So follow-up was made with more people enrolled in this study. And at the later situation, the incidence of neurotrip defect was no longer statistically significantly greater in those uh, on dolitegravir uh, versus the fibrous or non-HIV. Uh, so this is the, the, even if numerically, there was still a greater uh, a number of neurotrip defect in the dolitegravir, statistical, statistical significance was no longer there. So that is important to consider, especially since uh, dolitegravir decreases viral load faster in pregnancy and have been shown to be associated with uh, a lower uh, adverse outcomes in pregnancy uh, uh, than a fibrous, for instance. So again, in pregnancy, uh, uh, decreasing viral load is important, uh, but many studies, uh, 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 many newer antiretroviral, unfortunately, don't have solid data in pregnancy yet. That's why you still see uh, recommended uh, so, uh, uh, ratagravir, adesanavir, darunavir, ritonavir, procedure, uh, FTC, or TGF, TGC, or perfect TGC but this is because of lack of data with uh, a lot of the newer agents. And prior to this newer analysis that I just show you, this was the NNH uh, uh, DHHS guideline uh, recommendation revised 2019, that is prior to this presentation in 2020, showing that uh, the uh, dolitography is no longer associated, associated with statistically significant increase in order to defect in the sepamo, sepamo uh, 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 trial. So you have a uh, study. So you have to expect some changes in guidelines. 
So immunologic non-responders are people who, despite virologic suppression, just do not have an appreciable increase in the CD4 cell count. While vaccine, this strategy has not uh, responded to any intervention. So don't uh, antiretroviral switches um, or ad uh, addition of ant uh, antiretrovirals or, or other in ancillary interventions have not been shown to work. So, but this is in, uh, a sort of increased morbidity and mortality antiviral switch or adjunctive therapy to increase the count do not improve outcomes and, and are not recommended. Focus on OI prevention and ruling out alternative causes of lymphopenia. And the data, however, this is uh, um, uh, uh, on, the, on, the, on the positive note, suggests that PJP prophylaxis can be safely stopped if CD4 count is between 100 and 200 in the setting of virology suppression. Now, Cost is a four-letter word, so I don't like to utter it very often, but switching, uh, this is a cost-effective analysis uh, uh, already dated now, uh, looking at uh, cost effective of switching uh, to two drug regimen, Dolotegravir lamivudine, and this had been uh, <clears throat> approved for initial therapy. And then we're gonna see, we visited that regimen in the tango in terms of uh, optimization. Do not use these. They've been tried and failed. Booster present inhibitor monotherapy, all too often, and uh, dolotegravir the monotherapy. There have been disturbingly many studies, again, still trying this, uh, this uh, uh, strategies. Uh, booster dazanavir plus ritegravir have shown high rate of failure. Um, maraviroc plus booster present inhibitors or maraviroc plus ritegravir, high rate of failure. So, these are strategies uh, in a nutshell that are, are not recommended because they've been tried and failed. Let me recap. For optimizing antiretroviral therapy in the setting of virologic suppression, the first question is, should you do it? Why? Yes, if that means simplification, if that means greater tolerability, fewer interactions, uh, a fewer uh, uh, ease to administer around food, and possibly uh, pregnancy, but the orthography and neurotic defect issue is probably moot in, uh, at this time. Analyze previous antiviral uh, exposures, failures, watch for drug drug interactions with new antiviral therapy. Simplify can have many, uh, uh, many assertions. One is single tablet regimen. Another one is dual therapy, fewer drugs. Another one now is injectables every month or every two months and fewer options to come for simplification. Durability and toxicity, think cardiovascular, think bone, think kidney, weight gain issue evolving. Uh, as of yet, we don't have a strategy to address it if it occurs. So just discuss it up, discuss it upfront. Interactions, important in the aging population, use interaction tools like the Liverpool one. And pregnancy, we've talked about the evolving uh, in the positive sense, uh, issue with the retrograde and neurotic defect. Uh, cost is a consideration. Uh, and immunologic non-response, while concerning, especially if silver can remains below 100, uh, there's no approved strategies to address that. Now, let's go back to our questions to recap and we will discuss the appropriate answers to both. 54-year-old man, virologically suppressed on this regimen, um, and a baseline CD4 count 120, uh, HIV and was 85,000, uh, um, uh, HIV type, uh, HLA B one negative, hepatitis B immune, hepatitis positive, but RNA negative, received this regimen, this diagnosis, and, um, and <clears throat> And current laboratory values uh, as, as virologically suppressed with very blips. And again, that, that leads me to say that the blips, uh, if, if you go back to a detectable, do not predict future failure. And CD4 count is 650, current clearance is 80. Um, multiple comorbidities, hypertension, cardiovascular disease, uh, asthma, GERD, fractures, and had to take omeprazole and inhaled fatigazone. While they're satisfied with the regimen and concerned about having to take them around meals, what would you suggest them to do? And um, 
And this is what there was a mistake in the previous slide because uh, the switch was coordinator arrangement, switch uh, to big telegraphy FTC TAF, or switch to dolutegravir telegraphy back of FTC, apologize for the mistake, and switch to dolutegravir telegraphy real or switch to elva telegraphy copy system at FTC TAF. Please vote again. Okay, let's go ahead and see the results. Excellent. So I think that at least uh, there has been an evo uh, evolution since uh, we uh, asked this question at the beginning of the lecture. And now let's look at the uh, uh, reason for the answers. Now, this is need to take with meals, uh, a problem with fibrin, uh, uh, PPI in, uh, interactions, a problem with fibrin, TDFFTC, decreased BMD, and this patient already has fragility fracture, so definitely should not uh, stay on that. Uh, back up here, possible increase with, uh, card of cardiovascular risk. Repivirin, again, need to take with me and PPI interactions. Uh, even if uh, repivirin, uh, the retegravir would be uh, reasonable as a switch uh, uh, in this variety suppressed person, this would be a problem. Uh, switching to the uh, Daruna Viocobisista FTC TAF, uh, uh, you know, Daruna Viocobisista has possible increased cardiovascular risk. Uh, and then, then we have, uh, uh, I told you about the tale of the, uh, a steroid exposure uh, with uh, 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 COVID-6 that uh, boosted regimens, like a uh, or Darunavir. Second question, MS is a 35 year old white man with uh, 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 on a fibrous FTC TDF for the past 10 years. I've been very reluctant to change a regimen that quote unquote saved his life. However, uh, uh, due to uh, patient insomnia and, and uh, depressed disorder, willing to consider CD4 card is 700, not too shabby, but it's uh, undetectable. Uh, a switch to big telegraphy FTC tab will likely result in which of the following? No change in his weight, as he was already biologically suppressed. Uh, weight loss, uh, given that TAF has a few metabolic complications. Weight gain because of the switch from TDF to TAF. Weight gain because of the switch to from the five range to big tech review, or both three and four. Please go ahead and vote. There were already very good response in the pre-test, so hopefully a much better re response in the post-test. All right, let's uh, look at the answers now. Excellent. So again, um, both, uh, a switch to TDF and TAF associated with uh, uh, weight gain. First, uh, the German retrospective study by Gomez et al, and then the opera study. And so three is correct. Switch from NNRTI to be associated with weight gain, and uh, that has also been shown in a, in a number of studies, including the NA Accord analysis. So both three and four are correct. So, um, I thank you for your attention, and I think uh, Jose will uh, moderate the Q&A. Yes, so Dr. Bedimo, you'll be able to locate the questions using the question and answer button located at the bottom of your navigation. All right, so let's go right on to it. Um, based on the earnest and second line studies, uh, PI second line regimen uh, post NITI based uh, first line. The NITI backward does not matter as long as adherence to second line is optimal. Why is this principle not applicable to HT Dolterigravir based uh, 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 second line to following NITI regimen? Okay, so um, I, I hope I understand the question. So. <clears throat> Between class switches in the setting of biologic suppression have few uh, uh, evidence-based data. We have extrapolated from many studies, uh, including second line, which is a biologic failure. And that, uh, 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 um, uh, and so it's likely uh, to be a good switching to a especially high barrier drug like Dolotegra or Big Tegra view. So we are extrapolating. That's the only thing I want to make uh, clear to uh, the 
uh, the attendee uh, from studies that uh, looked at switching when people were uh, um, uh, still virologically, uh, um, had still had viremia and were moving to uh, uh, <clears throat> a regimen to suppress the viremia. Okay, so what would you suggest in an HIV naive patient previously uh, on PrEP uh, this COVID, uh, however, uh, tested positive for uh, HIV. Again, that is uh, outside of uh, uh, the scope of, uh, 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 of this uh, uh, presentation because we're looking at optimization in setting uh, for virologic uh, suppression, not uh, uh, naive uh, uh, patients. Now, there have been uh, some um, uh, data suggesting uh, showing uh, resistance uh, in people who uh, uh, fail PrEP uh, because uh, uh, from uh, TDFTC or TAFFTC, important to do uh, uh, resistance testing in that uh, uh, particular patient uh, prior to initiation. So, which insti and weight gain, uh, with insti and weight gain, is it prudent to switch someone on boosted PI based regimen? with uh, risk of ASCVD to INSTI. <laughs> Do we have data <laughs> to, uh, uh, to say uh, one is superior to the other and reduce future ASCVD? This is an excellent study. Now, what I will refer to you is the NEAT 022 study in Europe. And these were people who had high, um, uh, the, uh, the analysis were done in people with high cardiovascular disease risk on boosted PR and switched to adolitegravy. Uh, Things that happen on the study. Uh, lipids significantly improved, which is supposed to mean improvement in cardiovascular risk. Inflammatory markers, including uh, uh, TNF, decreased, which is supposed to mean theoretically improved uh, risk because inflammation, pro inflammation, is one of the drivers. <clears throat> um, no, uh, uh, it was more modest weight gains and have been seen in other switches from PI to INSTI, such as observational study, the uh, uh, NAR code that I presented to you. And interestingly, uh, you have to look at things like adipokines, like adiponectin, which they measured in this study. And the low adiponectin mean uh, <clears throat> uh, increase um, uh, inflammation in, in the, the fatty tissue. So we do not, uh, we do have some data from other uh, uh, studies suggesting that um, the Q, the, the, and, and this is an analysis from advanced, so not naive patients, uh, not experienced patients, but naive patients looking at <clears throat> ASCVD risk score, uh, uh, which may increase with uh, initiation of uh, NST. So a, a, a good question, but on the balance is still unclear whether uh, the switch to uh, from uh, PI to NST will be a sort of increased cardiovascular disease uh, risk. I believe it should be because <clears throat> um, uh, the data like uh, DAD have shown increased cardiovascular risk with darunavir, and we know decreased lipids and decreased inflammation. However, there's increased weight, which uh, has not been shown yet conclusively to increase cardiovascular disease risk. I hope this is clear. This is as much information as is available. Okay. Long-acting injectable antiretrovirals uh, are going to change the whole scenario. This is a statement, I suppose. Um, well, time will tell. It looks like many patients prefer that, so we'll see. What is the mechanism for translocase inhibitor? Okay, so uh, we know that nucleoside tra uh, um, reverse transcriptase inhibitors uh, are blocking uh, the, the 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 chain of uh, 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 building um, <clears throat> uh, uh, um, RNA, but the translocator inhibitor had a further mechanism uh, uh, inhibiting translocation of the reverse transcriptase, and so so that add this add a stringency to the chain termination. This is as a, a naive uh, virologist that I am, I can explain to you. That resulted in a much greater um, uh, <clears throat> potency. And since the, uh, the, the regimens, um, like uh, it's the drug like Slatravir also has a much longer half-life, uh, which is what I think that is gonna be used 
more. <clears throat> okay, any reason to believe oral carbotegal refrigerant intermittently at time of missed dose of injectable carbotegal refrigerant wouldn't maintain virgin suppression to cover travel? Excellent question. Now I will be giving a hand-waving explanation because there's no data. And this is uh, covering somebody who is traveling is gonna be a challenge. And I believe that ought to be the strategy, but I do not believe, and don't quote me on this, I do not believe that oral carbotegal repeatedly is being commercialized. I believe it's being given uh, to clinic as leading for people who will be um, uh, rolled into uh, carbotegal repeatedly injectables. But I don't know that the two drugs <coughs> Uh, oral formulations are commercialized. Now, don't quote me on that, but that's what uh, I believe I know. <clears throat> so, can you review the resistance that was developed um, uh, in uh, the latte trials? I understand that the resistance developed in patients that did not miss any injections. How can we account for that? So, now I will uh, roll in uh, not just the latte, but also the Atlas and Flare. And they were polymorphism, uh, like a 71 uh, D, I believe, that were seen uh, um, uh, in people who, who failed and there were some uh, resistant, uh, a few resistant development, but it's unclear. <clears throat> I'm not sure <clears throat> excuse me, um, that I have an answer to um, uh, the, the, what, uh, 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 accounted for this resistance beyond that. Uh, that. <clears throat> okay. The next question, the tango was 90% men and 15% African-American. So that is not an appropriate comparator. <clears throat> Excuse me. Should not be considered in the discussion if the target group is not included. Well, Point well taken. There is a, a, a lot of uh, uh, a push for having a greater representation of not just women, but uh, racial and ethnic minorities in trials so that we can have a better interpretation of the data. And so, <clears throat> uh, can you further comment on the data, uh, uh, long term injectable cartridge refrigerant for PrEP? Um, uh, uh, an eventual possibility uh, for use in IV injection, including a leading phase. Uh, 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 masterful uh, presentation. Thank you so much, uh, Dr. Santana. And <clears throat> what I think that we, in, uh, if you uh, uh, follow the um, um, HPDN uh, uh, 084, you will realize that there was a superiority of uh, the, this uh, regimen. Uh, in the PrEP compared to TAF FTC. So really, this is something that uh, uh, we will have, we will likely have um, uh, uh, <clears throat> indications uh, in the PrEP realm as well. And uh, the, 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 the FLAIR study was for Antarctica Naive with the lead-in, and the ACLAS study was looking at people who were already experienced, uh, but then switched to carbotegravel repeatedly. Uh, uh, really, uh, this is gonna be a quite a paradigm shift, and, and I totally um, I, I agree with you, Dr. Santana. <clears throat> so um, um, here we have uh, drug interaction uh, with corticosteroid inhaler, even yes, and and, and especially uh, with fluticasone, but those and I doesn't seem to carry that uh, 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 interaction. Now there is still a significant amount of uh, absorption of inhaled corticosteroids, not as massive as injectables or oral, but it's something to be uh, mindful of. So. Um, uh, Jose, you will tell me when I need to shut up, and I will, <laughs> okay. So until then, I'll keep going. So this is a study with uh, RVD suppressed, not, I want to make sure I understand the meaning of RVD, suppressed uh, tepilatic on control, uh, sorry, uh, on dolitegravir, while on vaporet on lamotrigine, an antiepileptic up Optimal uh, therapeutic drug levels. Uh, could carbamazepine be added and how to manage uh, 
Kabosi in Dolce Gabi interaction, uh, Lamotrigine interactions, and Vaproic Lamotrigine interactions. So, well, these are all uh, um, you know uh, complex patients, and and I would uh, uh, I would just uh, in, encourage uh, you to you now if we talking about a patient who's already virologic suppression of your regime, as we move in, please uh, look at all these uh, 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 new agents in a drug interaction analysis like the um, um, uh, Liverpool one. Some of them are tolerable and, and some of them not so much. So very uh, seriously, I would like to um, uh, encourage you uh, to do so. so um, I'm told that we get into the end. Uh, so um, it's a question on a patient uh, diagnosed no community with big TARV and uh, uh, developed leuc uh, leukopenia. So uh, unfortunately, you don't have a uh, to discuss that. This is uh, not uncommon, especially if your patient if of uh, black uh, um, um, uh, race uh, uh, and, and, and African American. Uh, and so we, we need to look at uh, several uh, possible explanations from other drugs that might be interacting uh, to um, uh, on the, on the underlying cause of lymphopenia. Now, uh, some of them will be benign lymphopenia yeah, and neutropenia in people who tend to be mostly of uh, African-American descent. So sorry, Jose, I think I'm, I, I went over time and uh, I will stop here. And I apologize if I did not get to your questions. I think that um, uh, Jose, let me know if uh, uh, people can submit questions and I'll uh, answer them offline or email or otherwise. So, but thank you all very much for your attention and and uh, it was a pleasure uh, spending this hour and fifteen minutes with you. Thank you, Dr. Bedimo. As a reminder for our audience, evaluation and how to claim continuing education credits will be emailed by 5 p.m. Pacific time tomorrow, and this will enable us to review all of those that have attended today's webinar. And this webinar will be available on demand at the ISUSA website, and to sign up for upcoming webinars, please visit our website as well. And information regarding our upcoming CME course, Hot Topics in HIV Medicine, is available on the ISUSA website. And lastly, our COVID-19 dialogue series schedule is up on our website. And we have a upcoming dialogue on COVID-19 epidemiology and public health update this Friday. We'd like to thank our presenter, Dr. Bedimo, the audience for your participation, and to all HIV clinicians working 24-7 to continue to provide care to people with HIV during this pandemic. This concludes today's webinar presentation.